yeah we have been uh, live in the youtube so we can go for that hmm so how are your uh, travel plan to go on teresa i'm uh, sorry please please so how, we will uh, yes so uh, how you have uh, planned your travel plan to uh, goa Ah yes I we will arrive at the 6th December and we will stay two days in Goa and then we will come to the conversation at um, the 8th and we will first do the um the part for the, the yes the human part and then on the 10th we will stay at the veterinary congress and then on the 11th on the morning time we will leave have you booked your tickets or uh, in the 11th have you booked the ticket or you have not we have okay okay you know in 11th we have oh, another so is it... ah okay we have planned another conference on 11th ah uh, okay at 10 am so if you can stay up to 12 noon then it is fine So is it possible, or you have to leave early morning on eleventh? I think we have to leave early morning. So we think the plan is to leave at seventh in the morning time. I have to ask my father if okay. there's any possibility to change that a, a bit. Yes, yes, because on eleventh uh, we have another conference where people from different uh, parts of uh, you know people are coming, different vets. We have another. It's a uh, Uh, the topic is nutritional security in the global scenario okay. for sustainable development so it is with uh, indian council of agriculture research we have designed it's a half day program yeah. so you can be attend there also because same vets will attend but more vets are coming to this one okay so you can meet some more vets so Good. that was yeah. our planning i forgot actually to ask you because a few days are left so i will share you that uh, also so you can plan because you are coming means you to attend yes, both of them no huh? that will be benefit both of us okay okay so i will start in another 4 uh, to 5 minute uh, people are joining because it's uh, 7 pm uh, in uh, india yes. so i think another 2 to 3 minute will start okay i think uh, i will so. just check uh, with uh, dr katrin also okay yeah Hola.
good evening one and all my name is uh, dr bimal choudhry i'm working as a veterinary doctor in uh, government of odisha in india so today we have uh, with us our moderator dr chandrasekhar sahukar he is uh, retired as a joint commissioner from ministry of animal husbandry government of india to so his credit he has brought many laurels to our department he did uh, the uh, parity of medicos with veterinarians in india and due to this actually we got uh, this parity all over in different states of india uh, he was the only veterinarian who has worked with the planning commission for more than 10 years uh, to his credit he has uh, after retirement he has started his own museum called as agri museum where actually he is collecting the different art culture and in fact the veterinary culture so welcome uh, dr chandrasekhar saukar sir thank you very much yeah thank you very much for giving me opportunity for introduction for this seminar so am i audible yes yes sir you are audible sir Yeah, yeah. And uh, with this, uh, I uh, let me introduce uh, our uh, speakers, uh, and yeah. we have some eminent personalities are with them. Uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Theresa Sita Rosenberg. You must be hearing the middle name Sita. Sita is you know it's a common name in India. Uh, she is wife and also she is the goddess. Uh, Theresa Rosenberg is. an ayurvedic physician uh, basically she is a human doctor uh, she has done her msc in ayurveda and is a practitioner of natural medicine with her own practice for humans and animals she is an equine economist bsc long time trainer and animal nutritionist both for dogs and cats Theresa Rosenberg uh, has written several scientific papers on topics of veterinary ayurvedic medicine and author of the first book on ayurveda therapy for animals in germany language she works as a lecturer and ayurvedic physician in the rosenberg panchakrama therapy and competence center and she leads the department ayurveda for animals of the european academy for ayurveda she has uh, completed her bachelor degree in equine business at uh, nutrigen with the bachelor thesis use of ayurvedic medicinal plants in horses possible therapeutic approaches for the treatment of eczema allergic asthma and fecal water with distinction in 2018 she obtained the healing license as practitioner of natural medicine in germany in 2019 uh she graduated as medical ayurveda specialist from european academy of ayurveda in 2019 uh she became the therapist rosenberg ayurveda panchakarma treatment center with 26 bed hospital in brishte in 2019 she also started ayurvedic practice for humans and animals currently she is working as the director for the department of ayurveda animal health and therapy at the rosenberg european academy of ayurveda she has been graduated as a dog and cat nutritionist and she has written a book ayurveda for tier ayurveda for animals uh, in uh, 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 germany language it also the therapeutic coordinator at the rosenberg panchakarma treatment center to his credit to her credit she has master degree in ayurvedic medicine from middlesex university london with a master thesis ayurvedic tongue diagnosis jeeva parikshya in dogs today uh, she will speak about uh, uh, our uh, the topic is equine ayurveda holistic ayurveda therapies for horses so let us listen from dr theresa rosenberg and uh, dr theresa uh, we have uh, with us is dr professor punya murthy sir is there from tdu dr mm padi sir is there he is uh, the retired uh, deputy 
director general of ccrs and he was the director of ayurveda pharma pharmacopia who has actually written instrumental in writing the ayurvedic pharmacopia so the institute is pcim it is located in india maybe you can take up the some of the ingredients and i think uh, dr padi will interact in between because uh, he has personally visited uh, your institute long back and i think uh, he will interact with you after your presentation thank you so now may i request uh, dr teresa rojanbak to start his presentation to start his presentation yes thank you for your nice introduction i like to speak today about the uh, equine ayurveda a holistic ayurveda therapy for horses mm, the first sheet is about my person you have thought so much about me so i will cut this short and get up to my presentation so ayurveda in equine medicine is an ancient tradition you know that better than me that um, the Ayurvedic treatment is written in old books and mentioned in um, really old works. So now we have a new science. Um, we also can adapt it to our two-day science, but the ancient tradition, which can be adapted um, to two-day state, and modern veterinary medicine and the knowledge of nutrition, husbandry and pharmacology is really important for us. So, so I have to find here my, I can't get forever, wait one moment to change that one here. Okay, so, ah, good. Yes, um, first we heard about Ayurveda um, horse treatment in the works from Palpakya Piawan and also Shali Hotma. They were the firmest um, veterinary specialized in the treatment of horses and also elephants. Shali Hotma's work, I think you all know them, is Ashwa Ayurveda. Here he describes the treatments of horses really basically and the work Ashwa Vedya Chukamam by Sri Jak Jakadattadam contains anatomically principled symptoms from the disease patterns and also the knowledge about the welfare, the breeding, the husbandry and the feeding of the horse and also the disease treatments of the horses. So here also we see it is not about to just um, feed the right plants. It is also about all the life of the horse. So um, also well known as the law Ashwachitiksa, the treatment of the horse by Nakula. So we see it is not a new science we talk about. It's a really an old tradition and we will see how it works in our modern days. So how a queen Ayurveda works in the practice today. A good Ayurvedic veterinary should be able to customize any therapy to the horse's constitution. In Ayurveda, we call that praxity and also the internal balance, so the vicuity. So praxity and vicuity is really important um, in the Ayurvedic treatment because here we see the individual part of the Ayurvedic treatment. So a constitutional assessment is therefore essential for a successful therapy. So I really have to look which horse, which animal is in front of me. How can I get a good feeling for that? And in the next step, then I will see all the symptoms and analyze them in detail. And the fluence of the doshas, acne and the datus in assessed so we not only see the symptoms and maybe also the results of it, so we also see the doshas, acne, and the tissue. So this is really important. The right feed supplements, but also adaption of diet, husbandry, always balance the excess of doshas and the disturb of, of acne and datus. 
but also fit to the individual constitution of the horse. So we have ones to see what can be balanced as best, also what is manageable, but also what is the best for the individual horse, which constitution do we have here, and how we can um, give here a good um, overviewing. First, we have to recognizing the constitution of the horse. Here you will see a sheet. Um, I have shown you here a typical Vata, Pitta and Kaffa horses. So of course not every point is Vata, Pitta or Kaffi, Kaffa, but the most of them. If you see a Vata horse, um, they're really fine bone. They are quite thin. They have bony, prominent vision and veins. And they have also these defined joints. You will really see the thin parts. Mm, they have most time fine and thin coats, so they're freezing, and it is really also really soft. They can be a little bit dry in the coat, but most time when they are healthy, then they are just thin. You also see the the skin between the coat and. Most time it is dark coat color, so um, black or dark brown. Here we have a white horse, which is possible also. So in the philosophy, we have um, most dark color. So we have dark urine, we have dark and dry execrations. We have little perspirations because vata um, is quite dry and also dark. So we have dryness in every part of the animal. Also, the little perspiration is a sign for that. Usually, they um, are not sweating while working, but sometimes afterwards, then the sweating coming more uh, around them. The psych we see really um, agile horses, they can be a little bit nervous, anxious, also jumpy, a little bit shy. They have also, um, yes, the quick reaction. So we can see we just have to be quite carefully with them. They also have a sensitive, um, yes, feeling about um, also other animals and also humans. Yes, yeah, so here we have really fine and um, sensitive horses. These are really um, important parts to see a um, water horse. So if we have a pitta horse, here these are strong horses. Pitta horses are strong but not heavy because they have um, um, muscular physique, they have a silky and shiny coat, mostly they are wet brown or fox coated colors. Um, also in the physically, we have yellow urine and um, green, yellow or moist extraction. Um, they have much sweat and much perspiration. And pitta horses are horses you see on the feet and think, wow, okay, this is a pitta horse. So they really have a good, um, a good meaning. Um, also in the psych, they are strong-willed. They're not so easy to handle because they have a lot of power. They are high motivated. They like to work. They like to be um, in focus. Um, yes, they are not, sometimes they are really intelligent. It can be really good for them because they learn really much and really fast, but sometimes they also learn the wrong and then it's not so easy to get it to the them to the right way. Then we have the Kaffa horses. Kaffa horse is a heavy horse, it's a strong and stoically building horse. They have dense and stable coat, light coated colors, mm, also light urine, light and moist oil extractions. They have, uh, yes, they sweat only through the chain, through the training. So Usually we don't see a Kaffa horse sweating just on um, the ground or on the field, but in the trainings, they have a lot of um, perspiration. They're really well behaved. They're easy to handle. They are phlegmatic a little bit. So sometimes it is not so easy to get them a little bit motivated. They are really friendly and calm. 
they react well to the food and um, so with food we can motivate them quite good and also um, they are slow to to react so sometimes a leecher is needs a little bit longer that a kaffir horse does what it should to do but we also see this if we are using medical herbs so a water horse just need um, less of the dosage. The pitta horse is the usual dosage and the kaffir horse just needs a little bit more from the herbs, needs also a little bit more time that herbs or therapies are um, working. So they just um, also see these physical qualities in the reaction of herbs as an example. Then we have to see the dosha vikriti through a sense assignment of the characters. So now we see that the doshas not only bring some um, characters with, with the animal, it also brings um, diseases. So now we see that um, vata horse, all symptoms related to dryness and roofness. So typical diseases are constitutional constipation, flatulence, we have the dandruff, also dry cord, hoof quakes, atrosis. So in the atrosis, we have the dryness in the, in the joints, in the hoof quakes, the dryness in the hooves and the dry cough, we have the dryness in the lungs. So you see the dryness is a really important part from a water horse or water animal when it's get up too high. So all, also the most symptoms are related to too much cold. Yeah, so um, if we have too much cold in a vata horse, um, it'd like to be a lot of lightness and irregularity also in the movement. So um, the movements are not so clear and jumping. They like to have freezing, they um, get cramps, Pain, so every pain has also a component of a water disease. We have the emication and also the ataxy. So we see a lot of parts also in the um, movings to see. As a pitta horse here, the symptoms are more related to much fluid, also to exodicy and heat. Mm, so these characteristics lead to diarrhea, stomach pain. We have stomach ulcers also when it's getting longer with um, stress. We have also the skin irritations, eczema is a really typical pitta problem. When they get sick, they often react with feather and um, all kinds of inflammations. Rotting processes are typical for pitta constitutions and also for pitta vikriti. So then we have the kapha vikriti. The kapha vikriti is um, related to weakness, slushiness and softness, also sweetness. So this heaviness is a really important part here because this leads to obesity, equine metabolic syndrome, diabetic metabolus, we have the apathy, yes. Then also we have the symptoms related to mucus and stickiness. These have we once in the lungs. So we have the COPD, we have the nasal secretions, which it can be too much, the mucus in the eyes, and also the edemas, which are quite often in the legs. Then we don't only we not only have to see the prakriti, so the usual part of the horse, the healthy part, and then the diseases and the vicuity of the horse. We also have the stage and the strange of acne because acne is the driving focus of the self even healing power. So we really need to see. Um, and that acne has to be in a good work and in, in a good focus. Here, vata is related to visham acne, we call it, yes? So um, typical of visham acne is um, 
irregularitification, we have tendency to the obstipation and the bloatings and the cramps. So also the colics can be really typical here. We have the diarrhea only with excrements and movement. So this is quite typically that usually they have obstipations, but then when they are in stress, also they are in the movement and in the training, then they have the reaction with diarrhea. Then we have the fecal water, um, usually with stress, sometimes also when the food is changing and weight loss. So to stabilize the acne um, for water horse, it is really important to have fixed feeding times. So there have to be a quite good routine in the days and in the nights. They like to have warming and moist feeds. So here we have really to change the dry and more moist and warm. You see in the Vikriti, we told the most related parts have the dryness and the coldness in the liquidity. So here we are really looking to get warm and moist characteristics in the feed mat. So um, then it's really important they don't have stress. They like to rest while eating. So sometimes it's better to take them separate and um, feed supplements like fennel and uptwine can be really useful for the daily lifetime. The pitta is related to the tikshna acne. Tikshna acne is a strong acne. So here we have a regular frequent um, defecation. We have tendency to diarrhea or loose feces. We have full smelling feces and stable metabolism with exercise. So um, for pit horses, it's usual that they don't get heavier or lighter when you change the food or when we have the change in the years. To stabilize and calming the acne for, for, for pitta horse because the acne for pitta horse gets sometimes too strong and then we have not so much nutrition for the inner base. So here we are also have to calming the acne. And um, here is um, little fasting through raw age contents. Also the bitter substance is really important. Here we use a lot of herbs. In Germany, we have these herbs also on the fields. Um, in other countries, we need to give them as a food supplement. And also alkaline feeds are really important here, not to use the hay large, more to use the dry hay, because here we have too much moisture here, we can use the dry characteristics of the, of the feed. Then um, really good supplements can be turmeric, liquid, so, uh, and also all the green herbs. Then we have the kaffir horses. Kaffir horses like to be or like to have a month acne because everything is a little bit too heavy, too slow. So here we have really to stimulate. Mm, so they have normal shaped or loose droppings, often with an oily or greasy coating, sometimes also with a mucous coatings. Mm, and we have weight gain and little food and also fat pads. So the fat pads mostly on the shoulders or behind. So um, this is quite typically when we have a month acne vicinity. So here we need to stimulate by, by frequent but small amount of feed. So they need to quite often, but little amounts, um, usually from hay or also from the grass. And feed with dry qualities and metabolism stimulating feed supplements. They can be ginger, pipali, or also gumia malaki. So, after successful analysis of the cause of the disease, we call it victory, and the target balancing um, therapy can be started. It's really important. First, we have to do these three steps you have seen before to analyze the pregnancy, the victory, and also the acne, and then a good therapy can be started. Mm. How does that work? How do we get the right therapy for the individual horse? 
Yes, first you have to see the properties which are too high. So which properties make um, the viquity. So, and then you balance that with the opposite properties. So we find these properties not only in every food, um, like the grains and also fruit like carrot, apple, barley, oats, corn, they all have different properties. So in Ayurvedic treatment, we really decide these um, gains and also the fruit, which properties we can use here for the healing time. Then we have um, very medical, uh, yes, the medical plants, the Ayurvedic medical plants we can use here, um, but also in every diet. Um, life hacks. So you see, as an example, we have hot water bottle against too much cold. So we can just fill a hot water bottle and put it on the back of the horse to reduce too much cold. We also can, if we have too much heat, we can cooling the legs with cold water. So here we already know and already work with these opposite properties. And um, the same, it works with food and with suppl um, supplements and also with the housebandary just to think how I can balance with the properties. Also massage can bring a really balancing effect also for the energize in the horses and we call that nadis, these are ener energy um, movements in the horses. So we can use this one too, also with oil. So we have the inner therapy and also the outside therapy. A good Ayurvedic therapist always includes um, Yes, in addition, in addition of administration of medical plants, the prevention of horses and husbandry and feeding. So we not only try to balance with the properties when we already have the liquidity and some diseases, we also try to find the right husbandry, the right feeding and the right herbs for a healthy um, animal, for a healthy horse. So that um, the self healing process can be working. Now I have an example. I will show you this at um, the disease uh, hay allergy here in Germany. This is quite common. This is allergic um, bronchial asthma of the horse and. Now I will show you the Ayurvedic point of view to this um, disease. So the hay allergy manifests itself in the form of allergic asthma in the bronchials. So in the Ayurvedic um, part, we call it tamaka swasha. So um, it is mainly caused by an obstruction of the pranavaha shrota. The pranavaha shrotas are the transport system for the respiratory gases and vital energy. So that's the breathing system. And the allergic asthma bronchial um, contains symptoms of uh, disturbed vata as well as kapha because we have the obstruction. This is the vata point. And we have also the congression of the bronchial tubes, mostly with mucus. So there we have the kapha point. Often we have first the vata in the disease causes and later on the kapha, like it is on the, in, at the hay allergy. First it's the obduction and then um, after the obstruction, then it came to the mucus and the congression of the bronchial tubes. So the kapha came afterwards. But then when we are called as a veterinarian and um, yes, the animals really need some help. We most have both parts. In addition to the cause is acne weakness. So we have mand acne most time, or also rhizom acne can be the cause. And often with excessive production of metabolic intermediates. So here we also have to have to stimulate the metabolism here. 
So what we do as an Ayurvedic therapy for hay allergy is to balance the properties of cold, dry, roof, mucus, and solid. So these are the properties of the vata and the kapha dosha. So in the ahara, ahara is the food of the horse. We try to reduce the vata and the kapha with light digestible liquid mesh. So it is, um, I don't know if you know that in India. So it is a liquid, some herbs, some grasses, and also some grains. And you put in there some hot water, and then it gets a, quite a mesh, we call it like that. And um, also soaked hay cups. So there's the cutted hay, and this is pressed in some cups, and these we really use um, hot water just to soak them. Then we can use water or steamed hay. So also the usual hay get be steamed to get more um, moldy and less dry and root. And you can also use grass or silage um, to balance these properties. In the vihara, vihara is um, the husbandary of the horse um, and also some daily, um, usually, yes, some daily parts. Um, so we can use one compress. We put some compress in um, the neck of the horse, just in the upper part. Um, we can use stimulating massages, so whole body massage, like we note from, um, also, yes, from the um, human part, like the abhyanga, we can also use for horses or animals. So just um, go from the head to the feet, to the back and uh, to the back feet. And again, to the front side, we can um, use the therapy of the mama points for lung for the lungs. So there are special mama points. Mama points are energy points which are connected to the inner side of the horse. So we have it on the inner side of the legs and also on the belly some which we can use um, for these diseases and also pinda massage. Pinda is like this, um, is like a um, herb stem. You, we can use, so you see it on the um, picture below. And there we can also stand and making some um, circles and also whole body massage. And these herbs, they are really um, stimulating the metabolism. They are um, reducing toxins and also um, moving the energy so the self-healing process can be eff more effective. Then we have warm inhalations with archwine. In horses, we use it that we have, um, you have really hot water. You just put it in a, like, a, like a garbage and then you put archwine in there and over that, you put a little bit hay so they can feet um, below this inhalation and then they just breathe this part of the hot water and with the streaming. Also, we can use it um, in a horse garbage and um, we use there some special um, electronic things. So also with the solar, maybe you know it, that we just spread the solar and then they, can, they stay in this um, solar and also in the stream and um, can breathe it. Then it's important to have lots of exercise and daily routine. So lots of exercise with using kapha and also the breathing of the lungs getting better so that there is getting some um, reducing of the mucus and some movement in the bronchial parts. And the daily routine is really important to reduce the water points. 
In the Shodana, we are using Dajamula Niruha or Mahanarayana Anuvasana Bhashti. So Niruha and Anuvasana, these are animals. So animals um, can be used liquid. We're using here the traditional um, Dajamula um, remedies and also with oil. Oil, we are using less amount and for the Niruha, we are using maybe, yes, it depends on the biggest of the horse, but maybe 200 or 500 milliliters. And the oily uh, enemas are mostly something between 30 and 60 milliliters. So here we are reducing um, the water points and also we have a really good and important part in the Shodana treatment. Then we have the Shamana treatment here. We like to use feed supplements. Also in my um, thesis, we work with Adatoda Vasika, it's called Vasa, Ali Pizza Lebeck, it is Shirisha, and Glyceria Gatla, it's Yastimadu. We have the Pippa di Longung, which is really important, but we just use it in less amount because it is quite hot for the horses. And then we have Lavanga and also the Shunti we can use here. So usually we use the um, more, um, yes, the more bitter parts we use um, in way more amount and less amount in the hot or spicy parts of the feed supplements. Yes, thank you for your attention. I hope you had a good overview in the treatment of the holistic um, Ayurvedic, yes, treatment of the horses. Now I have to log out to get that back. Yeah, it's uh, in, it was indeed a you know nice presentation, and actually you have made my task difficult. You know, now I, yes, I'm, I know. I'm searching for a, you know, I'm searching for a word, how to thank you. Ah, so, you know, I, when I was studying in my school days, I was listening a word that is called as listening from the horse mouth, but I've never seen, you know, so today, I, you know, I, I felt that feeling, you know, uh, it was really a, you know, different type of modality, which we have never done. In India, you know, what we thought that our ethno-veterinary practice, we take it as a veterinary Ayurveda. But there are a lot of difference between ethno-veterinary practice and veterinary Ayurveda. In yeah. fact, you know, in, in, in Ayurveda, there are three prakriti, that Pata, Pita, Kapha. So if you will see that traditional Chinese medicine, there are also this QE, NRG, Twina, so different modality are there. So you have rightly, you know, put this platform in a, in a better way. And I would you know, like to thank you for your insights and you know, your uh, PG thesis must be an award-winning thesis because you have done a nice thing on horse. So uh, I would like to you know, invite questions. If we have uh, some participants of questions, then I'm, uh, I, I will be happy to take uh, that one. Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Satish speaking from Kuwait. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. So how about you? Thanks for the fantastic presentation. I have no words as you have told, like it was really a very nice uh, presentation. And I have uh, some horses with uh, heaves, some horses with uh, skin infection. So mm -hmm. this was good for me to give a very good uh, move. I would definitely proceed with this. And uh, one of my cousins has recently completed Ayurveda. So I was just thinking of getting your help. Now I can directly get the help from you. Thank you once again. And then I would try to plan to get some materials or uh, pamphlets regarding the materials, which would be nice for me to go ahead. Because I'm in Kuwait, getting an Ayurvedic medicine is not as easy as, as it is in India. Like. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you <laughs> once again for the organizers. Thank you very much. I will Hello. Keep
Hello, may I speak few words? Yes, uh, pro yes, Professor Padi, please go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Theresa. Uh, actually, uh, what uh, presentation is made by Theresa, uh, that is based on uh, mostly Ayurvedic principles. Uh, so, uh, for our veterinarians who are undergoing a degree courses or PG courses, uh, having a scientific background, uh, it may be a little bit difficult to understand uh, the basic principle of Ayurveda. That is why during our time when our uh, DG was uh, Professor Labekar from Maharashtra, we had uh, written to your veterinary council of India to including one paper in uh, of Ayurveda in the BVSC syllabus. I think that has been included. And uh, the question is that uh, if that paper is uh, practically studied by all the degree holders of uh, veterinary, then uh, it will be more convenient for all to understand the basic principles. I am very much, uh, I, I have to appreciate, I have visited Bristol, uh, the clinic of uh, Mr. Rosenberg and uh, the visiting professor from India. If I think you told uh, Theresa is daughter of uh, Mark Rosenberg from Bristol. And uh, uh, during uh, along with our IU secretary, I had visited their clinic, their Panchakarma facilities, and Dr. Gupta from Pune was regularly visiting that. He, she has a very nicely understood the basic principle of Saibe because you see, simply if you say Bata, Pita, and Kapha, it will not be understood by many. So, what are the modern components which can be correlated with Bata? Or Pitha, just like she has narrated to some extent, uh, Bata is correlated with the functions of nervous system. So any uh, disorders related to muscle joint and nerves are mostly Bata prone. And uh, she has narrated this Pitha, they, this Pitha Prakruti. Prakruti means first you understand uh, what are uh, for the human being. Bata Prakruti, Pitha Prakruti, Kapha Prakruti and mixed Dondaja Prakruti like that. So what are their physiological characteristics? And to which diseases they are susceptible, then what will be the suitable medicinal plants? And uh, in the next uh, sometime, I will narrate you how we had worked on veterinary pharmacopoeia. Because all the pharmacopoeia published by the Ministry of IU still now are based for human beings. Uh, and uh, we had worked, we had compiled uh, 50 formulations related to veterinary practice. And uh, that book has been released very recently on Ayurveda Day. Very recently, four or five days back, on Ayurveda Day, the same has been released. That is the official document. But uh, it should be your platform is a very good platform. Veterinary Association, along with our Pharmacopoeia Committee, Minister of Ice, all should mix together to bring some publications which will be understood by uh, all the veterinarians. And uh, I think it is already in practice. I have visited several states related to veterinary practice, herbal medicines in veterinary practice. In Andhra, we found 48 formulations are being supplied at government level. Similarly, it is in all the states, almost all the states. And in another um, uh, fact that most of the books uh, uh, written on veterinary Ayurveda related to elephant, horse, cattle, uh, they have not been published till now. So we should have some effort to translate them uh, just like Palakapya uh, uh, told uh, by Theresa, this is Jayadatta and Salihotra for us, Palakapya for elephants. These books are still lying in several uh, repositories or uh, libraries and uh, unpublished, written in Sanskrit. And they need to be translated into English. So very much thankful to um, uh, Theresa. She has narrated very clearly and uh, she has explained the Ayurvedic principles in a correlated way, I think in the future. She will do very good practice. And uh, thank you to uh, organizers. I appreciate the presentation of Teresa. Thank you. And I will speak in some elaborative in elaborative manner later on, if I get an opportunity. OK, thank you, Dr. Bimal Chaudhary. Uh, thank you, sir. You know, we are really indebted uh, by your insight, by your thought process. In fact, what you have started, you know, five to six years back, Last year only, you have, we have a MOU with our Ministry of Ayus and Department of Animal Husbandry to include Ayurveda and its principles in the veterinary science. So a committee was formed last year, and this year they have you know, designed a course starting from the first year to final year. And it will be taught as a complementary medicine, not uh, 
as a competitive medicine to our existing veterinary practice so uh, basically we will look for this geriatric part we will look for the cancer part those which are not curable by our this allopathic medicine then, so yes, i think yes. uh, veterinary ka- yes dr yes, abimal uh, actually we had written during 2009 and uh, we had received yes, a letter sir. from veterinary but what is happening due to change of uh, administration designatories then the things are so much uh, kept dormant now it is implemented yes, very very well and in the ayurveda they also the volume fast containing 50 formulations compound formulations mentioned in the veterinary uh, these manuscripts or books they have been compiled earlier but published very recently because a lot of work has to be done standardization part this identification part this chemistry part then doses and other things recently it has been published due to this mou and we hope in future you will get some proper books textbooks for your syllabus that will be better i think thank you yes sir thank you sir uh, any more questions uh, for dr theresa is yes, uh, dr bimal yeah yeah this is punim murthy here uh, namaste sir yeah namaste i am uh, uh, i'm uh, thankful to theresa sita as you said a very common name there yeah. so uh, i think this is something uh, everybody should know that there is no single uh, modality of treatment which we have been used to as veterinarians and uh, animal owners so now i think uh, people have realized that a holistic approach you know as you rightly mentioned the chinese they use uh, a certain uh, uh, forces of the body and ayurveda has got the understanding siddha has got the understanding of the vata pitta kapha prakriti concepts and then uh, some other earlier mediterranean uh, uh, medical system they talk about four forces so now we have come to a stage wherein we keep everything open and there is no single system which is uh, complete in any sense whether it is human or animal so my point is she has been very eloquent and uh, our congratulations to her for presenting theresa and then another important point i would like to make a sort of underlining is that we are moving an inching towards Uh, to a, a very noble concept of one health and veterinarians have got a great role to play in this is being highlighted by theresa's presentation that's my uh, uh, humble feeling so we are moving towards that and we definitely move forward to take uh, one health as a real thing to be achieved soon with a holistic approach of health either in animals or human beings thank you nice all the best thank you sir Uh, any more questions okay uh, i think we will uh, move with our uh, second uh, lecture so at the end we can ask the questions i think uh, theresa will be there uh, uh, after this session also you can ask her okay yes uh, thank you now may i invite uh, yeah now may i invite dr katrin bhantoft Dr. Katrin van Hoft is a Dutch veterinary doctor with over 25 years of expertise with dairy farmers in various parts of the world. In 2011, she founded Dutch Farm Experience, a company connecting international experts of the most innovative and sustainable dairy farmers within the Netherlands. Between 2014 and 2016, she headed an international exchange program to reduce the use of antibiotics in dairy farming since 2015 this is organized as the foundation for natural livestock farming of which she currently functions as executive director this international collaboration between netherland india ethiopia and uganda promotes the use of herbs and ethnobotany practice as part of the so called natural livestock farming is a five layer strategy there is now clear evidence of the positive effects of this strategy on both cattle health human and as well as environment what we called as the one health welcome dr katrin bentoft thank you thank you dr bima and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, session um uh, i will open my i will share my screen right now 
um, here. Can you see, please? Yeah. It's yeah, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would like to share with you my experience on natural livestock farming, the international collaboration to promote cattle health and milk quality for this uh, session today. So I hope to contribute to the discussion uh, in preparation of this World Ayurvedic Conference in December. Oh, la la. Um, next one. So yeah, uh, um, this is some background of um, some countries where I worked uh, in Bolivia, especially, and other Latin American countries, also in Africa. And this is a, a, a picture from the uh, exchange program we had. And uh, so I've worked both in large, uh, smallholder and large scale dairy farming. Here it is uh, dairy farming in the Netherlands. So uh, what I'd like to share with you is that natural livestock farming is actually, as uh, Professor Puniamuti uh, explained just now, it is uh, a practical contribution to one health. And why is that? Well, it is because we are working on healthy animals and uh, reduced use of antibiotics and un, uh, other chemicals. And uh, through um, uh, the production of uh, residue free products, we contribute to more healthy people. And also through reduced uh, uh, chemicals in the environment, we contribute to a more healthy environment. So um, One Health is an important um, uh, aspect and we are contributing to that. So uh, why that is so important and uh, is also, and as you will probably all know that the antibiotics between, uh, that are used in livestock are the same antibiotics that are being used in um, humans. And uh, the, um, 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 the re resistant uh, microbes can move from animals to humans through the food, but importantly also through the environment, through the manure of the animals and the manure of the people. Uh, um, uh, resistant microbes can go from the environment to humans again or to the animals. So it is a whole setting. So if we don't work on a one health uh, way, uh, um, addressing both uh, animals, humans, and the environment, uh, we will not succeed in uh, reducing um, antimicrobial resistance. So natural livestock farming is, uh, um, let me check this, um, is, has expertise, especially related to uh, effective support of dairy farmers in reducing the use of antibiotics and in improving cattle health. And it is both in smallholder and large scale dairy farmers in the world. And we know that it results in both uh, increased quality and quantity of milk, also improved farm income and also uh, uh, reducing uh, the residues in the milk. So it is now a validated experience, especially in uh, through the important work uh, in India. Uh, and uh, it is very important, uh, especially in low and middle income countries, because if uh, there is no action at farm level, um, uh, antibiotics will increasingly be ineffective for humans and animals, but not only antibiotics, also dewormers and uh, insecticides, for example, acaricides, will be increasingly ineffective. And um, it, the other uh, issue is that if there are residues in the milk, the consumers will not trust the local produced milk. And that will, uh, um, uh, that will lead to a collapse in local dairy markets. And that is uh, threatening the livelihoods of millions and millions of, uh, of livestock producers. And that will then of course affect their livelihoods and also country economics because consumers will want to uh, uh, drink milk from powdered, imported powder uh, 
So that will affect country economics. So we've been starting our exchange program in 2014. Um, you recognize the faces of uh, Dr. Nair, Professor Muni Muti here. These are uh, Dutch veterinarians and farmers who came to the Netherlands on the topic of reducing the need of antibiotics. That was also because at that time, uh, there was a new legislation in the Netherlands um, uh, that antibiotic use in livestock had to be reduced by 70%, 70 percent, 70. And um, so there was a major interest in, in other ways of addressing this issue. So we uh, farmers and veterinarians were motivated to come to India and truly impressed with what they saw in terms of ethno-veterinary practices, in terms of the knowledge, in terms of the documentation and validation practices. And uh, then they came to the Netherlands and the, the exchange continued looking at what herbs are available in the Netherlands, uh, what can be done to do, uh, apply under large scale dairy circumstances. This is a large scale dairy farm in uh, the Netherlands. So, but then we uh, concluded actually that only herbs will not do the trick to reduce antibiotics and, uh, and to do everything to improve uh, cow health. You really need to also focus on uh, animal management and importantly also on breeding. And uh, so then we did another exchange um, to Africa, especially Ethiopia and Uganda. And the, here, this are pictures from uh, Uganda. You see the local breed, it's called local uh, Ankola longhorn cow. And what's happening in uh, Uganda, similar to many other countries, that the local breeds are being crossbred and continuously crossbred with uh, HF, also in Friesen. And you see that uh, gradually the color changes and the horns are becoming reduced. Uh, as a 50% and then the next generation 75% and then ongoing until the calf is nearly uh, a full bred HF calf. But that uh, animal, they don't resist the local circumstances, especially they don't resist in the case of Uganda, they don't resist the ticks. And so the tick problem is much higher. Farmers uh, are spraying the animals, but then the ticks have become resistant. So uh, the problem in Uganda is beyond the problem of resistance against antibiotics. It's also resistance against the caricides. And this really is a threat to human health. As you can see here, the farmer without any protection spraying insecticide and also the residues in the milk again. So together, uh, after this uh, uh, three year period, we came to uh, what we call the natural livestock farming five layer strategy. It's a holistic strategy to uh, improve uh, cattle health, to reduce the use of antimicrobials and towards sustainable dairy production. And it has five elements, improved animal and farm management. So that means housing, feeding, uh, um, water, uh, care of a recently born calf, all of that. Then the second level is the use of local breeds or so to say strategic breeding. So you will have an animal that is resistant or that is uh, able to cope with the local environment. And the third element is the use of medicinal plants, ethnovet medicine, but also herbal products use. Then the fourth level uh, is the quality of the milk. So residue free milk, but also um, A1 or A2 milk, like different qualities of uh, milk produced by various breeds. And then the last, uh, but a very important uh, aspect is the income of the farmer. If there is not an increased income, it will be very difficult to, uh, to upscale a practice. But in, uh, we have seen that um, the strategy improves the income of the farm. 
So how are we working? Well, it is a collaboration between the four countries, Netherlands, India, uh, Ethiopia, and Uganda. We build on a variety of knowledge systems, of course, farming, farmers knowledge, uh, Western scientific knowledge, but from India, your Ayurveda uh, knowledge is really crucial in this. And then we combine, uh, especially the grassroots expertise from farmers and veterinarians with scientific backup. The scientific backup is really crucial. And then we do pilots with the implementation. So these are uh, uh, participating organizations in Ethiopia, Ethiopian Society of Animal Production. In India, of course, you know, Transdisciplinary University in Gloom Siwa. In the Netherlands, it is Wageningen University and this veterinary knowledge system, a uh, veterinary knowledge center, Eastern Netherlands. Then in Uganda, we have uh, Lake Maburu Farmers Cooperative Society. And uh, this is now uh, uh, growing. So it is uh, truly an international network. So I will now give you an overview of what we have done and some of the results. So in India, well, you all know uh, that you are uh, the largest dairy producer in the world with smallholder dairy farmers as the large majority. You really have this impressive system of village dairy cooperative and milk collection centers that is unique in the world. Uh, that um, uh, agriculture contributes so much to the 17% national income, but applies a lot of workforce. You also have this issue of continued crossbreeding with HF, or at least you had. And uh, then, of course, you all know that there was a problem with uh, calf diarrhea, mastitis, and all these uh, dairy diseases. So, and importantly, in, in India and in also uh, many other countries, the over-the-counter sales of antibiotics and other chemicals is really uh, big. And at least I don't think it has changed over the past years. But uh, I remember when I visited, uh, when we visited with this uh, group, uh, we visited uh, small shops where you could buy uh, antibiotics. They would just provide all these antibiotics, which in the Netherlands for livestock are absolutely prohibited. Third, uh, third uh, generation antibiotics cannot be used in livestock. And, uh, but that is one of the problems in India. Of course, residue control, also, um, I think in the meantime, it has been implemented, but at the time it was there. Now, of course, uh, the work of uh, uh, TDU and Gloom Siva with the documentation and validation of, um, of uh, the herbs used by farmers. And so that now so many uh, validated herbal remedies are uh, acknowledged as safe and efficacious. And this, implementation strategy that was developed is really, really crucial also for upscaling in other countries. How to come from uh, ethno-veterinary practices by farmers and healers, which we know uh, have lots of uh, important and good practices, but there are also uh, practices that can have uh, other effects. And uh, so how to come to a safe use of herbal products. So this strategy with uh, the prioritization of animal health condition and the documentation, then the desk research, and then importantly, this joint rapid assessment where uh, farmers uh, knowledge and healers knowledge is combined with uh, uh, Ayurveda science knowledge and uh, Western veterinary science knowledge. All of that is really crucial and unique in the world, as far as I know. And that then leads to this identification of safe and efficacious remedies and the promotion, as has now been done in, uh, in India. So you all know, or I assume you all know, this remedy for mastitis with uh, aloe vera, curcuma, and calcium hydroxide, which is so effective. Well, this will all be well known to you. And then uh, here the other, it is really impressive what has been done. The bloat, indigestion, the others. The important thing of this is also that it is kitchen herbs. Of Many of the herbs are kitchen herbs, like uh, onion, garlic, 
black pepper, curcuma, that really boasts the, um, the confidence of farmers, especially of women that are used to using these herbs, to also use them in the animals because they're always afraid that uh, by trying something new, which, uh, which could be the, the herbal medicine, will lead to uh, uh, problems. So if it is kitchen herbs which people eat by themselves, they are more, there's much more confidence in, uh, in farmers to use and to, uh, to pilot with it. So you, as you will know that you have been doing this training, you have these videos and there have been the results which are so positive here with the overview of all the diseases and uh, over half a million cases that has been uh, uh, reviewed by the National Dairy Development Board, clinical cases and the clinical recovery uh, around it about 80% or more. I think the average is 80, 82%. And uh, now that you are in this nationwide training and videos, oh la la, I'm going back rather than. So your results and that I am also sharing in other parts of the world is that you have trained these FETs, 3000 FETs, 35,000 dairy farmers on EVP. Uh, that the average cure rate is 81.4%. Uh, then uh, antibiotic residues in milk was reduced by eight, nearly 88%, and over 90% of the disease, disease reduction, and 71.6% uh, uh, reduction of average cost of cattle health. These are really crucial outcomes that motivate other countries to uh, and um, other governments and other farmers to go ahead and try out. And importantly, uh, this was now adopted by the NDDB. And uh, uh, I understand also that the agricultural policy uh, is now in, included into this. So, and that you are also into basic veterinary education. So in terms of ethnovet, you are so much ahead of other countries. But, uh, and that is then, of course, uh, for upscaling is a really, really good basis. But there are also uh, several other issues that need to be looked at. So let's go to another country, Ethiopia. Here we are, uh, um, here we are uh, at the small hall, the dairy farmers in Ethiopia, uh, where we worked, we did a small pilot with peri-urban uh, smallholder dairy farmers and the way of keeping the animals are similar to most uh, cows in, the, um, in, uh, in India. And also the aim was to reduce the use of antibiotic, improve milk quality, revitalize knowledge of herbal medicine and to improve calf management. So we did uh, a participatory analyze and monitoring of the cattle health situation because most of these people uh, they don't speak English uh, much and uh, they don't read and write. So um, uh, we have a, a specific methodology of doing this. It's called the Wheel of Animal Health and uh, uh, the Wheel of Animal Health and Wellbeing. And out of that came that there is uh, lots of problems with calf uh, mortality. The calf mortality was around 60%. And there was also a lot of other diseases, especially of course, mastitis, but also uh, wounds, uh, several other uh, problems. So what we did uh, here, uh, uh, Professor ne uh, uh, Punyamoti and Dr. Nair came to India, they did the training uh, on the herbal medicine, you will recognize the herbal medicine perhaps here, aloe vera and black pepper and all of those that are also used in India. And there was also a training on calf care from a Dutch uh, farmer and also on hoof trimming. And the project results were also impressive there. They were very small project. It was only with 60 farmers but it was uh, impressive 
uh, because of the milk quantity in, uh, increased 50%, the calf mortality reduced 60%, uh, the farm income increased 33%, uh, the average cost of cattle health was reduced uh, what twenty percent. Antibiotic was reduced to eight eight percent. It was much less than in India, but uh, importantly, uh, the the use of antibiotic was much lower to start with because people didn't have the money to buy antibiotics. And um, and uh, also it was uh, seen that uh, E. coli in the milk was reduced a lot. And then, the, uh, based on this very small pilot, there was an increased acceptance by international NGOs and the government. And what was a very important conclusion also from this Ethiopian um, uh, pilot was that the women were the ones who moved at the head and who became more and more enthusiastic about it. Uh, it raised their status, it raised their leadership skills, and it raised their income and uh, uh, marketing initiatives, especially in the times of COVID, uh, when they had so many market uh, difficulties and transport difficulties, it really helped them. And these are uh, out some outcomes on the milk quality because there was uh, also a laboratory element. And uh, so uh, there was a reduced presence of E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus by 30%, but it was also shown that in most aspects, the milk quality also improved fat, protein, lactose, non-solid fat and density. And it, so, and it scored better than the reference samples from comparable dairy farmers. So it is really interesting to, to move uh, into these uh, milk quality uh, laboratory results, because that is also another way of, uh, of um, um, uh, uh, convincing uh, Western scient uh, scientific uh, uh, people. Now, if we go to Uganda, I explained about the problem of the ticks. And so we had a, a problem of ticks and tick-borne diseases. And um, it was a high use of acaricides. And um, there was also a high use of antibiotics because of the ticks transmitting East Coast fever, uh, which is a blood parasite. And then uh, the ticks are increasingly resistant. So farmers started using all sorts of chemicals like to spray with chemicals that are actually for tomatoes or, or that are actually for uh, killing uh, bats. So uh, all sorts of chemicals were used on the animals, and that is a tremendous uh, effect on uh, the biodiversity. Also on the tick-eating birds, of course, they get uh, intoxicated. So what you used to see, uh, the local breed cattle that had tick-eating birds on their backs, uh, consuming the ticks, now they are completely gone. And it is only, uh, at least in the areas where the spraying is being done, and uh, so the um, and the farmers only depend on the spraying. So some activities uh, in uh, Uganda was that um, if oh we did actually uh, uh, a pilot with uh, herbal tick control. Uh, again, uh, Professor Punimuti and uh, Dr. Nea came to Uganda. And we and uh, designed uh, a local uh, uh, a local recipe for tick control. That was tried out, but it uh, moved into difficulties with uh, with uh, uh, the local research institute, and uh, so this was stopped. But we hope to continue, uh, and also because of lack of funds. Now, other uh, activities in, uh, of NLF in Uganda are with, a, it's called Lo Lake Meburo Farmers Cooperative Society. And um, that is a farmers group that uh, is, uh, is uh, working on basis of the NLF concept, but they are doing it more based on uh, value addition of, um, of milk. So they have a, a milk tank they make yogurt and butter, 
and uh, they sell that. And they are also doing uh, diversification of income sources through indigenous bee, uh, tree species and beekeeping. They're also doing a, a trial with strategic crossbreeding with another breed called Flagfee. And they're restocking this longhorn cattle uh, um, also. <clears throat> and in the future, they want to continue with this uh, herbal treatment uh, of, uh, of uh, herbal tick control and also the same uh, training that was done in Ethiopia on the use of herbs for uh, common diseases they would really uh, welcome. So we are hoping to do that in the near future. Oh, so this is the pilot that was done on the herbal tick control. Here is the, all the herbs that were being used. So in the Netherlands, uh, moving to the a, a completely different system, um, it, you may know that in the Netherlands, we have a very large scale uh, dairy farmer, but we, at, at this point in time, we're in a, in a major crisis in dairy farming. And that is because of continuous scale enlargement and uh, the farmers are enormously indebted. They have huge farms and uh, uh, an average of over 100 animals, uh, but uh, they are indebted and uh, the, the money they make is uh, in many cases uh, very little. So they have an insecurity of income in spite of very large farms. They depend on subsidies and they depend on chemical inputs. Although the uh, antibiotic uh, use is uh, strictly controlled, but the major problem at this right this moment is the environmental problem, the because of excess nitrogen, too much manure, and artificial fertilizer, and that, and the loss of biodiversity. So uh, the Dutch uh, government is looking at uh, a transition, but it is very difficult to see how that can be done. At this moment in time, I can't uh, tell you all about this, uh, but we could do that in, a, in another uh, uh, PowerPoint to give you all the background of this uh, situation. But anyway, the challenges in cattle health are uh, similar to in other countries like mastitis, calf diarrhea, and importantly, hoof problems because of the very high use of um, uh, concentrates, and a very uh, uh, high productivity of the animal. There is a, a digestive uh, challenge and animals get hoof problems. So that is a really a major problem. So uh, we, as NLF in the Netherlands, there is a, a, the working on this transition to uh, a, a kind of livestock production with minimal damage to the environment with more respect to soil and biodiversity and more use of natural products to keep uh, animals healthy. So, and for that, uh, we're working on a new interaction between farmers and veterinarians uh, to see uh, how they uh, accept, not only to sell uh, chemical products to the farmer, but also to advise more and, uh, and collaborate on the use of uh, natural products. So one of the things that NLF in the Netherlands has done is uh, a training of farmers and veterinarians on, uh, for uh, one of the main topics is the herbs in grassland. Because in the process of intensification and scale enlargement, uh, there, uh, we have become completely dependent on uh, grass monocultures, um, English raygrass. And that has become a, a difficulty. And now in order to improve cattle health, many farmers are um, practicing or again practicing herbs in grassland. And the other topic of the training is the safe use of ready-made herbal products. Then uh, there is also a, a, a project to try to influence veterinary education. Veterinary education, the, the uh, faculty has been 100% uh, against anything outside Western veterinary science. So, but not, that is now gradually changing, but it takes, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. 
and we are actually working or would like to have more pilots on the natural control of worms and ticks because especially ticks because of climate change uh, is becoming more a problem and um, uh, it would be important to also look at ways to control that in, in a way without chemicals. And these are the stable books for farmers that have been produced on, um, on uh, natural products. But those are products like ready-made. And uh, stable books have been made by Maria Groot in Wageningen University on all these different species available in Dutch. And a few are available in English, but uh, those are not the latest versions. Now, it is important to understand that in this whole process of transition that we are coming in, in the Netherlands, um, old practices are regaining importance and they are coming back. Although slowly, they are coming back. And uh, one of the focuses is the focus on soil fertility, because uh, that was, um, uh, soil fertility has been affected a lot by this uh, very high input um, uh, dairy farming. The diversification of income and land use, that is an important one. For example, farmers selling milk uh, directly from the farm, but also uh, uh, here this uh, other activities on the farm, uh, like in this case, it is farmers golf. Then uh, strategic crossbreeding and the use of local breeds. This is one of the local breeds we have, which are dual purpose, and they are also coming back. And even our old fashioned Frisian cow, which is the original genetic uh, forefather of the Holstein Frisian. But this original Frisian cow um, is also dual purpose. And that is also a very limited way, but it is coming back. Herbs in grassland, I, I shared, and the use of herbal remedies and the stable books is also coming back. So what are we wanting to do as natural livestock farming in the coming years? Well, uh, we're having a new plan. It's called Healthy Cows, Healthy Food, Healthy Environment. And it promotes natural livestock farming as an effective one health approach. And what we aim to do is to upscale our integrated approach from these four countries to at least 25 countries in worldwide and reach at least a minimum of 2 million farmers, but I think we can reach many more, uh, especially to smallholder countries uh, or countries like low and, uh, low and middle input countries with smallholder farmers, but also to pastoralists and a uh, large scale dairy farmer can also uh, be addressed. But I think the main focus will be on the countries with smallholder uh, farmers. Then, of course, it is also very crucial to expand to other livestock uh, species. I understand in India you're already doing goat, sheep, chicken. That will be really crucial to do that in other parts of the world as well. And more students have to come in to do their uh, uh, NLF related topics. So I know that you're uh, into this uh process of upscaling veterinary ayurveda and i've been thinking about it what um what what would be uh, a good thing or how could we look at it from the international perspective well uh the first thing here is to really clarify is veterinary ayurveda the same as ethno veterinary practices i understand that that is not and, uh, but it really, uh, there needs to be a, a, a clear understanding of what we are talking about. And as NLF, we have been talking more about ethno-veterinary practices, but perhaps we should also include more other Ayurveda elements. I don't know. Then the second one is that Ayurveda uh, as a science is not really accepted everywhere. Um, uh, if you look at, uh, and also India, dairy is not something that people in Africa, for example, look at as an example to follow. So it's not automatic that uh, you say, okay, we have Ayurveda and we have, uh, um, it's, it's not an automatic thing. 
um, especially if you call it veterinary Ayurveda, there may be resistance. If you call it ethno-veterinary practices, it will be much easier. But anyway, that, that is, uh, it is just to, to let you know, because Ayurveda in, in our countries, like in the Netherlands, I know people that are really, uh, have, there is Ayurveda here, but it's also very expensive. So they think that Ayurveda is for rich people and not for uh, people with very uh, low incomes. So there is this connotation that you have to take uh, into account. Then in many countries, ethnovet uh, practices is seen as the general use of herbs by farmers. It is not seen uh, so much as um, the other elements of, uh, of which are also also part of ethnovet, like uh, 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 good management and uh, all of those other elements, like the uh, prevention aspect. It is often seen as the use of herbs by farmers to, um, to um, uh, control or to cure a disease. And uh, so we, you have to take that into account. And uh, as, as such, your methodology for documenting and validating local herbs and herbal practices is really crucial because uh, amongst these general use of herbs by farmers, we can't say that all of those herbal uh, remedies are all 100% safe or are all uh, excellent, uh, excellent herbal remedies. So there is a, a, it's really necessary to, to promote this methodology and to go hands in hands with uh, uh, farmers elsewhere, look at their uh, uh, local herb traditions and uh, together uh, document and validate and do pilots. So I think that will be a very a crucial step in this uh, process of upscaling. Now, uh, the other element uh, that I would like to stress is that you really have to look at um, farmers that go beyond uh, a few cows, but that want to use ready-made herbal products. Uh, that is a, a, a separate process that will need to take place in the near future. At the same time, it is also a process that is known to uh, create problems in terms of malversations, in terms of uh, um, uncontrolled use, in terms of uh, the safety and the efficacy of those uh, pe people wanting to make use of the needs of farmers. We have seen that in Ethiopia, no, in Uganda, with the ticks that were resilient to uh, the uh, to the acaricides and people came with the so-called herbal products and it turned out that it had uh, chemical products anyway. So you really need to look into this issue of the efficacy and safety of the ready-made herbal products as well. But a crucial in this whole process is that of course the use of herbs alone is not enough for cultural health you need to at least uh, look at uh, animal management and breeding of crucial importance. Well, uh, I guess all the veterinarians here will know that, but we can never uh, take that out of our uh, mind. If we talk about ethno-veterinary practice, we, we tend to think about herbal medicine only. And then uh, the last issue I would like to share is that um, we can, uh, uh, combine the lessons learned with dairy from both India and from the Netherlands, because uh, uh, the Netherlands is seen as the, uh, the big example of dairy farming in the world. At the same time, we have many lessons learned and problems. At the same time, India has many lessons learned as well and many uh, lessons to share. So if we combine these lessons learned and, and use that in our upscaling to other parts of the world, uh, I think that will really uh, help. So this is what I wanted to share with you. And if you want to get in touch, you can, uh, you'll be very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
take that out. Thank you, Dr. Katrin. Uh, actually, I like 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 to thank you on four dimensions. One, knowledge. Second, wisdom. Third, your contribution. And fourth is your perception. Knowledge that you came to India and you learned the EVP. Wisdom that you went back to Netherlands and you utilized the knowledge. Yeah. Contribution that you reached unreached people of Uganda and Ethiopia. It's far from the you know, Netherlands. And you went there, you helped the people. And yeah. the last one, the perception that you gave uh, towards our Ayurveda. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, there is a lot of difference between EVP and uh, uh, this Ayurveda. I think Professor Punyamurthy also can throw some light. EVP is, you know, it's uh, uh, like use of herbs. And what are we are looking at, you know, around? Uh, I have with us with uh, Professor Santana Palai. She is a professor in our uh, veterinary university. She is teaching this EVP to our students. In fact, you know, as you told that Ayurveda has not been so much, you know, inculcated in veterinary science, though it has been developed as a science uh, since last 5,000 years. Uh, it is codified, but it is for humans. But uh, as uh, Professor uh, M.M. Padi told, that it has not been you know, translated for the veterinary part. Only just uh, last year, we had a MOU with Ministry of Ayus that we will introduce veterinary, uh, this Ayurveda part in the veterinary science. So I think it will take some time uh, to get that knowledge. And what you uh, suggested that, yes, we have to you know, learn from Netherlands and India. It's definitely true. Uh, as uh, I think uh, Punyavati sir will be there, he will agree. But there was a paper publishing, uh, I think, in the newspaper that, you know, if you are going to treat the mastitis, we use fourth generation antibiotic and it costs 400. And what Punyamurti sir has developed, it costs only 40 rupees. So I know. the thing you told, uh, yeah, that is that aloe vera, what you are practicing. So what you told regarding that Ayurveda, it is very costly. Maybe it is a spa or wellness that is costing. But I think for treatment, it should cost less. That's why, you know, people in India who don't have much money, they go for Ayurveda instead of uh, this allopathy. And you have, you have mentioned that, yes, there is antibiotic residue is there and antibiotic microbial, problem, you know, AMR problem is definitely coming. And we've had such trying, you know, to go to convert to our, uh, you know, this uh, Western medicine practice to our EBP method. And as you told, not only in Netherlands, in India also, you know, our same fraternity, from we, we are also getting resistant because we have been taught about the allopathic Western medicine. Why suddenly you are, you know, trans, you know going to uh, this uh, EVP? And uh, I think uh, I, I one more uh, meeting we had, uh, you know, last week with FAO. So there were some organizations called as ILRI, International Lifestyle Research Institute. Then there is a BSF International. And there is another organization called as IGA, International Goat Association. So they all are working on the small animal. So I think uh, the model what uh, you work on the large animal, I think you can practice the same thing because in the lower dose, I think uh, Professor Punya Murthy can throw some light because I'm not the right person. So then only you can, as you are training around 30,000 farmers, you can train some farmers from those organizations also. So I think uh, they will be also benefited. So over to Professor Punya Murthy, sir. Okay, one minute. Can you excuse me for one minute only? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, before, before Dr. Punya Murthy, I want to speak something. Uh, yes. uh, Dr. Katrian uh, pointed out that uh, whether ethno veterinary practice and Ayurveda are same or different. I am to clarify that a few years back, uh, Indian Council of Agricultural Research had established more than six centers throughout India and collected the ethno, ethno veterinary practices from different states. And uh, our CCRS has also published one volume out of it. If I get opportunity, I will show you. And uh, ethno veterinary practices and Ayurveda are partly same and partly different. Because you know, we have for human also popular practices or traditional practices or tribal claims. They are somewhat related to Ayurveda books because since Ayurveda has been in practice in India for more than 5,000 years, suppose somewhere a Vaidya told, a Ayurvedic practitioner told 
yes if you have diarrhea you take a uh, make a paste of uh, lemon and um, take it then uh, later on it went to um, later on it went to a text and the texts written during medieval period that means between uh, 7th century up to uh, 16th century ne jo sidi ki ele mota asibo ni sidi ki ne jo seventh uh, sixteenth century then uh, in these books many of the local practices has come into text and uh, when the practitioner says something that is being listened by many public and they also go into practice then it from book it has gone to uh, folklore practices from folklore practices it has come into book so there is a correlation that is why partly you will find ayurvedic recipes in folklore practice and some folklore practice in ayurved but some are uh, entirely different mm, some, some are entirely different uh, because uh, some practices uh, made by public are not mentioned in any of the books so when for uh, when for uh, human uh, treatment we collect folklore claims we have a format and uh, in one heading we add whether it is mentioned in any of the text or not so in veterinary case, in case of veterinary ayurveda it is not done because not many books are published on veterinary ayurveda if transdisciplinary uh, university has taken up some program uh, they should first publish some textbooks based on ancient classics they should translate the books written in sanskrit they should also uh, publish some books which will be suitable for your bbsc syllabus then the problem will be solved and uh, you have already clarified uh, to dr katrian's point that ayurveda is very much expensive yes for panchakarma for other treatment it may be expensive there are also cheapest treatment available in ayurveda and uh, there is a difference between the classical and proprietary medicines that everybody should know classical medicines means which are described in the books written much earlier and uh, proprietary medicines are english name based medicines like himalayan batisha your ayurveda is there many ayurvedic companies are in india who are manufacturing veterinary products herbal products for veterinary practice and uh, they are already in practice and uh, you another point uh, made by katrina that we have should have some observational studies on this ki what is efficacy of these herbal products proprietary products and uh, whether there is any side effect that is the duty of veterinarian along with ayurvedic people you can have some project and we had identified some common areas where ayurveda has strength like your mastitis uh, deficiency of milk to increase the quality of milk and meat um, uh, this is skin infection eczema and other ticks and other things uh, um, uh, some already herbal products are there but it should be validated so thank you thank you dr vibel i have uh, some other engagement i will leave the meeting and i will again join tomorrow thank you very much thank you dr katrina and thank you thank you professor ma'am padisha for your insight uh, thoughtful uh, you know reflection on this evb and ayurveda uh, now may i invite professor kunyamurthy to have his perception yeah yeah uh, it was nice uh, katherine and uh, your camera is working today Uh, we were able to see you that's a good thing uh, about this i don't want to uh, give an elaborate basically uh, being a veterinary pharmacologist and uh, having worked for 20 years uh, the fundamental understanding is as sir was telling uh, just now it's a Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Ah, hello. You you are able to hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. So this is the classical systems are based on the folklore system. Uh, Charaka says in one place that if you have any doubt about the plants and some of the herbs you need you go to the cow herds and sheep herds in the forest so that is very clearly indicating these classical systems have developed over thousands of years of 
folk knowledge where people were living in nature much closer with nature they were observing the zoo pharmacognostic of the primate history in evolution so we also retain that so over period of when people and urbanization they were making clear principles to understand for teaching and following so this classical and folklore is a very two different streams but based on the common stream of understanding so this is one of the reasons why we take siddha and ayurveda for validation Hello, sir. You are disconnected. Dad, he is disconnected. I think. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, may I invite some few more questions? Uh, We will spread the team, Doctor Bimal. Yeah. I will. I will talk more elaborately on this later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Punyamathi sir. Uh, now may I invite uh, uh, Professor Santana Pillai. She had some, uh, uh, you know, some reflection on it. Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible, Doctor Vimal? Yeah. Yeah. You're on. Okay. So I teach uh, veterinary pharmacology and toxicology. Uh, in our as we are all talking that uh, veterinarians should be taught okay veterinarians has to be taught because they can practice it further in the field condition okay so in third year third professional year in under veterinary pharmacology and toxicology they have included medicinal plants we have uh, chemotherapy in type of course under it we have included the medicinal plants the scientific names common names active principles pharmacological actions and therapeutic uses of many herbs like ginger osimum neem piper withania leptania tinospora umbilica eucalyptus glycerigia aloe senna catechu etc are included the importance of these plants in elevating the diseases of animals are vigorously discussed with the students Uh, their effect, the pharmacological effects of those herbs, like anti-inflammatory effect, anti-pyretic, analgesic, antioxidant, anti-cancerous, anti-diabetic effect, all those are being taught to the students. Recently, the restructured and revised syllabus for the postgraduate programs are, are have come up. In that, they have included ethnopharmacology in the MBSc program and pharmacology of herbal drugs in the PhD program. Under ethnopharmacology for the MBSc students. the history and scope of alternate medicines in animals is to be taught they will uh, be they will be taught classification and identification of medicinal plants their metabolism interaction with the fight of the phytoconstituents standardization and clinical validation of the bioactive molecules from the plant sources therapeutic effects adverse effect of the potential herbal drugs are to be discussed with the students they will understand how the herbal galactagogues herbal carbinatives antiseptics antidiarrheas antihelminthetic etc are to be taught similarly in the phd course the pharmacology of herbal drugs has been introduced the here they will understand all the mbsc things along with that they will go for identification collection preservation isolation and standardization along with clinical validation of the phytomolecules the characterization pharmacological and therapeutic and toxic effects of potential herbal drugs will be known to them they will be given the strategies for development of herbal drugs certainly i hope uh, being teaching at this level in the bbsc mbsc and phd level it will increase the use of herbal drugs by the field veterinarians along with it the people who are in researches developing the drugs they will also adapt to find newer and novel drugs that can act against this resistance and drug residue like problems which are prevailing in our ecosystem thank you thank you uh, professor sampan uh, any more questions uh, dr bibal uh, madam told uh, uh, they are being taught uh, 
regarding a active principles and uh, molecules isolated from the plant whether they are taught about extracts because you see if you go to molecule level then it is the same as chemical medicine or allopathic medicine if you if you are taught with some extract effect of extract also alcoholic hydroalcoholic or water extract like that then uh, it will be more useful than uh, isolation of molecule so whether that is being taught uh, it is my question to madam yes sir generally when we, uh, yes i'm answering dr bimal i'm answering yes sir with certainly when we were pg students are working we are making extracts in our laboratory also we do ethanol extract uh, and uh, uh, aqueous extracts also sometimes we make mix uh, different solvents that we can mix 70% ethanol 20% of uh, ethyl acetate like that some combinations we do and we can see which type of phytoconstituent are more present in what and we can see the bioactivity of those extracts also those things we do in uh, mbs it depends on uh, the student or the guide who wants to take up those work those two works are certainly done sir right definitely then that is fine because if you go only for a isolation of a molecules then what will happen it will be similar to chemical medicine it will have a, um, it may have some uh, prompt efficacy but it will have much toxic effect that is why more emphasis should be given on extracts initial stage your ether or ethanol extract uh, that is fine but later on for edible form that will come as alcoholic extract or hydroalcoholic or uh, water extract like that so if that is the fine actually this is the beginning we are late ah yes. uh, we are late uh, that is why uh, all the things are beginning now and more validations are necessary though it is already in practice in more validation and thank you thank you dr bimal thank you sir it is better late than never uh, anyhow we have started our veterinary ayurveda uh, we have to De definitely know. definitely definitely <laughs> yeah you know uh, everyone asks you know we we indians uh, india not only indians every human being is, is become a logical they ask this uh, you know seven uh, wives and one husband one husband is how seven uh, wives are like uh, why what where whom so now you have to you know answer all the questions previously as you suggested you know initially there was like uh, uh, you know that saint people were uh, vaidya was there they were telling that you have to use this medicine for this disease so people were blindly using this but now people have become logical they become what is the you know phytochemical what is the mechanism of action why i should use the x why not i use y so that's why you know we have to validate it and as you told that we have to go deep into it and you have to substantiate our theories also yeah thank you okay uh, any 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 word from uh, dr katrin uh, if, if i want to reply yeah any any word any word you want to say oh okay yeah no i just want to um uh, i know that your the knowledge that you all have and which you have been sharing now again uh, is really impressive and uh, what we are aiming to do is to bring it to other countries so these kind of discussions are really good but um, and really valuable but you also have to look into what other countries are looking for and what they are able to uh, to link up with so that is what i try to share so thank you very much for yeah. this uh, opportunity yeah uh, in fact you know this year we have started a who center for traditional medicine uh, our uh, secretary general tradius from you know who he was here this year and uh, you know that center will help to collect all the traditional knowledge all over the world not only yeah, that good. like indian tradition indian traditional medicine ayurveda there is a traditional medicine from china that is called a tcm traditional chinese medicine we have some korean medicine some japan medicine then uh, some western herbal medicine uh, and some from uh, egypt we all are collecting that one and now we have taken it as a holistic veterinary medicine approach mm. so that is our own, own uh, you know you can say that is uh, that is really excellent but in many parts of the world uh, farmers uh, even smallholder farmers have completely moved into uh, chemical medicine so yes. to bring that back and to bring back the confidence in herbal medicine is not an easy task and that is uh, what we are working yes. for so i congratulate you with all these yes. uh, steps 
but now bringing it to another other parts of the world is uh, is the next one that is uh, necessary. So I'm looking forward to our discussions in December and uh, and to yeah. see how this can be done uh, more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Katrin. Thank you, Dr. Professor the ex DG, DG, and also the former director of PCM, and all the participants. Professor Hello, thank you. Sankuna. Thank you, Dr. Vimal. Can I just yes. take two minutes from uh, the valuable time? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. No. No. Uh, Dr. Vimal, thank, you. thank you for organizing this uh, fantastic program. And uh, thanks to the presenters and thanks for the organizers. And I would like to uh, just ask uh, Dr. Punyamurthy, um, who is a retired professor from uh, Veterinary College and Research Institute, is he the same guy? Because he was my professor in the college, pharmacology. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Punyamurthy was my professor in uh, Veterinary College and Research Institute, Namakal. Okay. Oh, this. Yeah, Dr. Satish, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sir, you are able to hear me, sir? I just want to thank Dr. Punyamurthy who was my professor in Veterinary College and Research Institute, Namakal. And this was a great opportunity for me to uh, know about this holistic uh, treatment, One Health. Thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Satish. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, request Dr. Sauka to have uh, his final words. Today's discussion were very inspiring. And this one, uh, we had uh, uh, Dr. Rosenberg has stated that we have ancient books like Shaliyot uh, uh, and other uh, this one. And actually, this Arabic treatment very fast during Mahabharata times. Uh, Nakul was the first veterinary doctor who was specialized in the treatment of uh, horses and uh, elephants. So actually, we should uh, uh, this Gajshast uh, and Shaliyot is still a script language. So as per uh, his advice, we should get, get translated into English and other languages. So it will be useful for Veterinary Ayurveda. And uh, Dr. Kathleen, as stated, there is a need to use uh, use uh, uh, less use of cross uh, India has more than 50 cattle breeds. So we have to conserve these breeds and they are highly resistant to our diseases. So it was uh, inspiring this one and now uh, Madam told that we are teaching this uh, uh, veterinary uh, herbal medicines. So there is an urgent need to use of this knowledge. So this is very inspiring. And uh, I'm very happy that we can again revive our veterinary idea. It will be used the whole world. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, with permission from our South sir, we, we are closing this.